Hey, George. Hey, Nick. Sorry to interrupt this episode of Reslayer's Take, but we have to tell the people about ButcherBox. Oh, yeah. Listen, friends, we only do ads for sponsors we think are great, and ButcherBox is on our good list. ButcherBox sent us each a customized box of high-quality meat, and they were so freaking good. It's so convenient having a box of incredible meat in your freezer without ever having to step foot in a grocery store. And the greatest part? This antibiotic-free and humanely raised meat comes with plenty of curated tips and recipes. So whipping up awesome dinners is a cinch. These prices are impossible to beat for the quality, and where the heck else can you get free protein for a whole dang year? Not the grocery store. So sign up at ButcherBox.com slash Reslayer and get our special deal. ButcherBox is offering our listeners a free-for-a-year offer plus an additional $20 off. Choose chicken breast, salmon, or ground beef free in every order for a year. Sign up today at ButcherBox.com slash Reslayer and use code R-E-S-L-A-Y-E-R to choose your free-for-a-year offer plus $20 off your first order. Let's get grilling. Ryan Reynolds here from Mint Mobile. With the price of just about everything going up during inflation, we thought we'd bring our prices down. So to help us, we brought in a reverse auctioneer, which is apparently a thing. Mint Mobile Unlimited Premium Wireless. How to get 30, 30, how to get 30, how to get 20, 20, 20, how to get 20, 20, how to get 15, 15, 15, 15, just 15 bucks a month? So Give it a try at mintmobile.com slash switch. $45 upfront payment equivalent to $15 per month. New customers on first three-month plan only. Taxes and fees extra. Speed slower above 40 gigabytes. See detail. Welcome to the Reslayer's Take. I'm George Primavera. And I'm Nick Williams. In this podcast, George and I lead a group of players through an exciting improvised adventure in Exandria, the magical world of Critical Role. We're playing Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition, but you won't need to know the rules to follow along. All you need to know is that nothing the players do is scripted or planned, and their fates are determined by their own cleverness and the random chance of rolling a 20-sided die. You can listen to new episodes of The Reslayer's Take every Monday, anywhere you stream podcasts. Or if you want to listen to the podcast two weeks early and uninterrupted by ads, join Beacon at beacon.tv. Last but certainly not least, if you're enjoying the story, please consider leaving a rating and review. Your feedback might inspire someone new to join this adventure. Now, without further ado, welcome, welcome to, to The, the Reslayer's Take. Take. The Reslayers take are sat along the staircase set into the exterior of the RST HQ, as Frog regales her friends with the events of the afternoon. Frog sits in front of her friends, opening up her journal, showing off the sketch of the Vexian that she just drew. So I met another person like me. They found me in the library. It was amazing. Um, and they told me a lot of stuff. They were actually the one to wake me up. But Dee told me I'm not the only one, and he's looking for others like us. And he told me that there are pieces of me missing, and that we might be able to find some. And I think I'd, I'd really like to find them. Um, I mean, he, he kept stressing that, you know, the past is the past. Frog looks to Poogs. And the only thing we can worry about now is the future, and what we decide to do with it. But I still think I would like to know more about where I came from. Kira unceremoniously plucks the journal with the illustration of the Vexian out of Frog's hand and says, This is a very handsome metal man. I... Fera, isn't he? He's very handsome. He's suitable. Is that what you were getting at? Like you have a crush on him? Oh, you said that crush word again, and I'm not exactly sure what it means. Okay, regardless of whether or not this handsome metal man is someone that you're interested in, did he point you in the direction of where some of your parts may be? Yeah, actually, he did have a lead. Um, there's this kind of um, merchant, he said, that likes to collect pieces from, from Aeor ancient things. And Frog rifles through her journal and points. He said it was somewhere in the, the Spectrum Gorge. That would be our first clue. Farrah tries to recall if any of what Frog is saying rings a bell. Roll a history check. Twelve. You know that the Spectrum Gorge is at the northern end of the Demethor Valley in South Isilra. Well, if, if we want to avoid Timpani's portals... It's going to take a couple days to get there. 
Why would we avoid timpani's portals? Yeah, they're great. They get you right there and lickety split. A to B, super quick. I'm trying to say every time we've taken one of these portals, we've almost died. I think I'm not being recognized for how difficult it is to teleport five people across the entire continent via tree. I mean, he is making a pretty good point. I, I don't know anything about any type of teleportation. Besides, what are the odds something bad would happen again? At some point, the odds have to turn in your favor. Wait. You're all talking like you're gonna go with me. Hira states matter-of-factly. Well, yes, we have to go. We have to get this heart so that you can fall in love with this beautiful man and be happy, Frog. Wait, I... Maybe I got lost. Is that what we're doing, Frog? Are we trying to find your heart? Are there other pieces? What's going on? Well, I'm not sure about the specifics, um, but Devexian said that his hope is to find out how to create more people like us. And so maybe we could become a family. Just out of curiosity, do you trust him? I trust him a thousand percent. All right, well, if you trust him, then I trust him. We need your parts either way. You can't be walking around without all of your pieces that need to be there. So we go to this Spectrum place. We find this merchant and uh, we take your parts because they belong to you. So it's very easy. Frog looks to all her friends. Wow, thank you all so much. I want to meet more people like me, but I feel like maybe I already have a kind of family with all of you. We feel the same way, Frog. Yeah, Frog, we are a family. And, you know, I can't imagine what it's like to be walking around knowing that you're missing a piece of you, but we like you the way you are now, and I can't imagine what it's going to be like when you're complete. You know, I, I appreciate the sentiment, Frog, but I feel like we like each other too much to maybe be family. Whoa. What's your family like? Where's the Spectrum Valley? The Spectrum Gorge in the Demothor Valley. It's, um... D- I mean, it doesn't matter. We're taking this stupid portal. Oh, yeah, I've been there loads of times. I'll just transport us via plant. And hopefully we don't land in quicksand. Oh, there's no quicksand down there, I don't think, Timpani, right? Yeah, last time I was there, it was real dry. Like, really dry. So I don't think there's any quicksand. Should I go make some cupcakes for the road? Great, you make some road cupcakes. Everybody else, get ready for the journey ahead. Collect everything you need and meet me back down here in one hour. Everyone begins heading back up to their apartments for a short rest. Farrah pulls Poogs aside. What was up with the last batch? Uh... There were no problems with the last batch and nothing bad happened. Farrah doesn't believe him. Roll an insight check. Dirty 20. Poogs' eyes are shifting from side to side, his ears are drooped down low, and he certainly looks guilty of something. Farrah stares daggers at him, waiting for him to say more. He cracks almost immediately. Okay, okay. I gave Bongo the cupcakes, and he was driving a carriage, and I walked by and said, Hey, do you want one of these cupcakes, Bongo? I think I fixed the recipe, and I think that you would like it. And he reluctantly said yes, because he smelled it, and it smelled good. And he took one bite of the cupcake, and he passed out over the front of the wheel, and the horse went into a building. That's so much worse than I had imagined. I think he's okay, but I saw him fall out of the carriage, and I I just got out of there. What did you put in it? The condensed slug milk was the only thing, and then a little bit of the, the stuff that I thought was... I, I put less salt in it than usual, so maybe that's the problem. I gotta add more salt. Farah tries to recall if there's anything about condensed slug milk that may cause this. Roll a nature check. Nat 20. Farah, you know that any milk extracted from gastropods, when treated correctly, can create a very potent sleep potion. Here's what you're gonna do, Pooks, okay? I'll do anything. You're going to make a couple of those cupcakes with the slug milk. Okay. You're going to give them all to me. Okay. And then you're going to make another batch. Okay. Without the slug milk. Without the slug milk. Without the slug milk. 
Okay? Okay. Okay. And don't mix them up. I won't mix them up. You know what? I'm going to watch you. Get okay, come with me. Let's go okay. make cupcakes. An hour passes. After carefully watching him, you make sure he doesn't mix them up. And you delineate the sleep cupcakes from the regular cupcakes with different colored icing. Fair takes the sleep cupcakes with orange frosting and places them in her bag. She allows Poogs to take the blue frosting without the milk in his. Okay, let's go see if everybody's ready. Poogs and Farah finally walk out of Poogs' apartment, covered in flour. Okay, Ear Devourer, eat up those flies. We'll be back really soon. Ear Devourer the spider, having formed a massive web in the corner of Poogs' room, chitters affectionately. I love you too. As Poogs and Farah exit, they see Frog, Hira, and Timpani outfitted and waiting for them. Alongside her knapsack, Frog has now also slung the large monster tome with a leather strap across it. Hira uses Frog's poncho to fashion a holder for her newly acquired egg. As you wrap the egg in Frog's poncho, you feel it wriggle for just a moment. <gasps> and based on this movement, you can tell that it is relatively close to hatching, probably within a week. Hira's eyes light up as she gently caresses the egg, hunching over it like a gremlin, and then secures it on her back. Timpani leads the group towards the trash-filled park and the one craggy leafless tree in the middle. He reaches up and knocks on the trunk three times. All right, team. He throws his hand into the middle of the group, no quicksand on three. One, two, three, no, no quicksand. No quicksand. And Timpani leaps through the port. Before jumping in, Farah looks over at Poogs' neighbor's house to see if there's any motion inside. There is a large stack of mail at the front door. Farah shrugs and jumps in the portal. Hira, my poncho really looks great on you. Here we go. And Frog jumps in. Hira kisses the egg, slings it over her shoulder, and jumps in the portal. Hira takes one point of acid damage and disappears. Hira does not care. Each member of the Reslayer's take steps out of a thick tree at the edge of the Spectrum Gorge. It is a sight to behold. Plumes of steam pour out of cracks in the ground and the sheer cliff sides. An enormous waterfall casts mist into the gorge, gathering at the base of it in a pristine pool. In the bottom of the Spectrum Gorge, Built into the side of one of the sheer cliffs is a mining camp. It is a three-story building made of wood and stone with exterior ladders between each floor rather than stairs. Tremendous mining apparatuses sit idle. One that looks like a giant wrecking ball sits directly next to the building, but all of the other machinery looks severely damaged, strewn across the bottom of the gorge in a chaotic pattern. The very bottom of the Spectrum Gorge appears to be about a mile down. Before taking another step, Farah looks around to see if there's anything that could possibly kill them. Roll a perception check. 22. Farah gazes down into the valley. There are black trails hewn into the already craggy terrain. You can see that the pool underneath the waterfall is shaped in a way that implies it should be the source of a river running through the gorge, but it is cut off by this black substance, which appears to be a kind of fresh, shining obsidian. There's a massive collection of this obsidian in the center of the gorge, which looks like it was once where a deep mine shaft was. However, it is fully blocked up now. The Demethor Valley expands behind you in a vast, verdant forest. I gotta say, it's nice to teleport somewhere without the threat of a big spooky ghost. There is suddenly a crack and a shuddering rumble beneath your feet. The leaves behind you in the forest begin to shake. The trees bend and snap and the ground lurches forward towards the gorge. Everyone make a strength saving throw. 13. 18. 2. Natural 1. Poogs rolls a 9. Everyone except Frog suddenly drops to the ground knocked prone as the ground under them begins to sift downwards into the gorge. A massive rock slide has begun. Something has loosened the earth beneath your feet. Oh! Erosion! Frog tries to quickly reach out and grab whoever she can. You see Farah about to disappear down a separate river of rock. Roll an athletic check. Ten. Farah, here! Grab my hand! Farah, roll an athletics check with disadvantage. 
seven. Farah just barely misses Frog's hand and begins to disappear down into the rock. Timpani, in full slide, dives two hands into the earth below him and casts Wall of Stone, creating a platform beneath them for the group. As the Wall of Stone protrudes out of the ground, all of you feel yourselves borne upward by a 100-foot-long, 10-foot-wide stone platform, which begins to tilt and careen downwards. Farah, you are just barely hanging on to the edge of this platform. Dragged along the rocky surface, you take five points of bludgeoning damage as rocks begin to fall on top of you, bringing you down to 47 points of health, and you all begin to pick up speed. Everyone except Frog, lying prone, holding on for dear life. Hera scrambles for the climbing equipment secured to her belt, grabs a baton from it, and tries to jam it into the rock to steady herself. Roll an athletics check. 19. The piton penetrates the rock wall, and you feel yourself anchored in place, gripping it tightly. Timpani attempts to push himself up with both hands to a standing position, balancing on the wall like a surfboard. Timpani, roll an acrobatics check. 13. Failure. Cowabunga the goal! As soon as Timpani stands up, the surfboard bounces, and he slams into his own board with great force. Timpani takes seven points of damage, bringing him down to 95 points of health. Timpani will now make a concentration check. Eight. The wall of stone begins to break apart into large chunks of rock, separating the party as they all begin to peel off. Farah, make a dexterity saving throw. 22. As the rock separates, it provides a turning momentum that allows you to swing yourself up onto your large rock. Hira, make a dexterity saving throw with advantage. 21. Hira also maintains her position. Frog, a dexterity saving throw. Six. Frog loses her footing, falls off the rock, and falls sideways into the loose earth careening down the hill. Because Frog's falls are naturally slowed, she takes a second to think, channeling her key. She jumps like the wind. Reroll your dexterity saving throw. Natural one. Frog, you slam into a rock that meets you coming down the hill above you. You take nine points of bludgeoning damage, bringing you down to 47 points of health. As you slam into the rock behind you, your gloves alight. And then you feel something, a searing heat on your back. You take a single point of fire damage as you realize the rock that you have landed on is very, very hot. As you quickly turn your head, you see that the rock that has slammed into you is deep black lava rock. Watch out for the black rock! And as the lava rock begins to protrude from the moving earth, everyone else's weapons alight as well. Hira rapidly knocks an arrow into her short bow deftly tying a rope to the end of it and aims for the black mass emerging out of the avalanche. Hira, roll an attack. 19. The arrow flies forward and bounces against the black rock, not penetrating. That is a miss. As the arrow boinks off, you hear a low, rumbling roar. The black rock begins to protrude even further out of the rock slide, and it billows steam from its top. It keeps emerging, soon 10 feet out of the sliding stone, belching black smoke now. Everyone make a nature check. Natural one. 19. 30, 20. Oh god, that's like a magma land shark? Why is it so big? As Farah and Hera shout to each other, ripples of glowing green cracks spewing liquid magma begin to leak over the stone. Frog takes another seven points of fire damage, bringing her down to 39 points of health. Timpani, regaining some sort of stability, casts Wall of Stone again, trying to bring everyone back towards him. The Wall of Stone springs up under them, flings Poogs into the air, who rolls a natural one to right himself. <laughs> he slams onto the very edge of the stone surfboard, taking nine points of damage, bringing him down to 12 points of health. We're gonna die, we're gonna die, we're gonna die, we're gonna die! Seeing 
Seeing the newly formed platform from Timpani, Frog feigns taking a deep breath and jumps off, aiming to land on the stone platform. Roll an acrobatics check. 24. Frog effortlessly lands on the new massive rock surfboard. Farah, finally having her footing, takes out her spectral crossbow and aims it at the magma monster. Player attack. 22. Her spectral bolt slams into the dorsal fin-shaped rock. Roll damage. 10 magical piercing damage. There is a grumble as the dorsal fin twitches. The spectral bolt is stuck into the rock, and leaking out is a ghostly green glowing magma. Seeing that it was effective, Farah takes aim and shoots again. Roll your attack. 12. A miss. Farah is jerked to the side as she barely keeps her footing on her large rock she is balancing on. Leaping from the rock that she's currently clinging to, Kira attempts to slide down the long stone surfboard and grab Poogs from the edge. Roll an acrobatics check. 22. Success. Not today. Huh. Thank you. The Reslayers take, except for Farah, balance on the massive stone surfboard that hurtles down the cliffside, and the lava rock dorsal fin moves alongside it. And then it rams the surfboard with a massive bump during your descent. Everyone make a strength or dexterity saving throw. 15. 19. 13. Poogs rolls a 15, holding on to Hira. Frog is the only one to fail. As Frog is flung off the surfboard onto one of the other massive rocks traveling down the hill, she is able to use her monk falling ability to reduce 23 fall damage to zero. After it slams into the rock surfboard, it drops back a small amount, beginning to poke its head out of the rock. Bright green eyes are lit up as a massive toothy maw opens, and there is a high-pitched wail that emanates from deep within the body. Everyone make an arcana check. 18. 18. 19. Ghost! You spot whipping green tendrils wiggling from within the mouth. Very nice! The marionette Bulet dives back down into the rock slide as the rock surfboard begins to slide to the very bottom of the Spectrum Gorge. I can't wait to ride on to see my trainer! Everybody make a strength or dexterity saving throw as the surfboard slams into the ground. Farah, your rock impacts in the bottom of the gorge as well. 14. 15. Dirty 20. 13. Timpani and Farah are flung off of their rocks as they hit the ground at great speed. In mid-air, Farah takes out the EpiPen full of Instajam and sticks it in her leg. All of a sudden, Farah's entire body turns a bright translucent pink and she splats all over the bottom of the Spectrum Gorge, obliterating in a moment. Meanwhile, Timpani takes 20 damage and is brought down to 75 points of health as he slams into the valley floor. <laughs> Hira and Frog are able to land on their feet, running forward slightly with poogs on Hira's back. Hira nervously skitters to the splatter jam and in a panic tries to scrape it together in a pharaoh like shape. Oh my god! Oh my god! What is this? As Hira desperately scrapes the jelly together, you see suddenly emerging from the puddle in your hands, Farah's face. <gasps> okay, what's up? What do you mean, what's up? You turned into goo! Desperate times. Farah's form begins to slowly reconstitute into a goo version of her normal self. As she tries to regather her crossbow, it slurps through her fingers. Uh, can someone grab that for me? And the short swords, too. Don't forget the short swords. I got it. What's going on with you? What is this? Hira takes a finger and nervously tries to push it through Farah's form. Hira's finger is inside Farah's chest. Farah feels nothing. She looks at Farah meaningfully. Don't ask me about the jam and I won't ask you about the egg. This moment of strangeness is interrupted by a shifting and a rumbling in the now dormant rock slide as the black fin 
circles away from you, and then begins to turn around for another charging pass. Oh my gosh! What do we do? What do we do? Behind you is the towering form of the Embersmith and Embersmith Mining Company building, miraculously still completely unscathed. And as you look around frantically, you see a figure staring out the window at you. You see in the window an elderly dwarven man wearing a sort of hard hat, looking down at you very concerned. That hat makes me feel like we can trust him. Mister, what do we do? What do we do? You hear the sound of flapping wings as a bat the size of a house cat comes flying towards you and clicks at you mechanically and flies towards the building. Timpani picks his face up out of the gravel, covered in road rash. Ugh, quick, get to the building! Without thinking twice, Hira scoops up Poogs and the egg and rushes towards the open door. <laughs> Frog follows. Farah slurps over to the door. She is moving at half her normal movement speed. I'm coming. Farah, hurry up, it's gonna eat you! The immense dorsal fin rapidly approaches Farah, rock blasting up out of the earth as it shoots towards her. Frog looks back and notices how slowly Farah is moving. So she runs to her side, pulls off her poncho, and tries to mop up and scoop up Farah as best as she can. Roll an athletics check. 12. From the bottom up, Frog gathers the gooey Farah up into the poncho, causing her bottom half to become formless and the same shape as the poncho. Uh, hey! And Frog takes off back towards the building as everyone else disappears inside. Timpani rushes alongside her, helping her carry the poncho full of Farah. Frog, make another athletics check with advantage as the massive bulette shoots through the earth. 12. Frog is not able to get away in time as the creature gets directly behind her adjacent. The massive, ghostly maw opens behind her and it makes a bite attack on her. Before the monster's mouth closes on Frog, she throws off her poncho, hoping that Farah makes it inside. Ah! Farah is thrown forward, splatting against the ground and rolling onto the ramp that leads up into the building. And the rock jaws slam down on top of you. Frog, you take 29 bludgeoning damage, 7 fire damage, and 5 necrotic damage. Frog is brought to 0 hit points. As the creature bites Frog, she drops down to the earth unconscious in a moment. Green tendrils begin to leak out of the mouth and move to wrap themselves around Frog's body. Timpani desperately scrambles to beat the tendrils to Frog. As Timpani grabs Frog, the tendrils grab her ankles. The massive maw open in front of Timpani. Make an athletics check. Tim. Which beats the marionette tendrils seven. Frog is pulled away just in time. Give me Frog back! As Frog comes loose, the marionette bulette closes its mouth, and having lost its momentum rather than pursuing, burrows deep into the earth as rock moves in to fill the hole it leaves. And everything is quiet. With the planning, recording, and editing that go into the Reslayer's take, Nick and I aren't left with a lot of time for exercise. Luckily, our sponsor, Tonal, has helped us use the time we actually have to create personalized workouts just for us. Tonal learns from your movement and provides suggested weight recommendations for every move, and they even give you detailed reports on your progress. They create personalized programs and workout suggestions based on your individual goals. Like me, I want the roguelike agility to backflip over dungeon traps. And I want the berserker strength to hold a heavy door up for my friends so they can escape the undead hordes thanks to my heroic sacrifice. With Tonal, you can do it all. It's like having a personal trainer at home with you. Unlike traditional gym equipment, Tonal uses adaptive digital weight to advance your training techniques. Whether you're a professional athlete or a cake-loving dungeon master like us, Tonal can be trusted to help you become your strongest, most fit self. Right now, Tonal is offering our listeners $200 off your Tonal purchase with promo code RESLAYER. That's Tonal.com and use promo code RESLAYER for $200 off your purchase.
Tonal.com, promo code R-E-S-L-A-Y-E-R for $200 off. Let's roll those athletics checks. Creating really great retail experiences is tough, especially with multiple stores, teams of staff, fulfillment centers, separate workflows. It's a lot. But with Shopify Point of Sale, you can do it all without complexity. Shopify's Point of Sale system is a unified command center for your retail business. It brings together in-store and online operations, even across a thousand locations. Imagine being able to guarantee that shopping is always convenient. Endless aisle, ship to customer, buy online, pick up in stores, all made simpler so customers can shop how and where they want and staff have the tools they need to close the sale every time. And let's face it, acquiring new customers is expensive. With Shopify POS, you can keep existing shoppers coming back to your stores with consistent, tailored experiences and first-party data that give marketing teams a competitive edge. Want more? Yeah! Check it out at shopify.com slash r slash all lowercase and learn how to create the best retail experiences without complexity. That's shopify.com slash r slash. Cha-ching! Hello, halflings! George Primavera here to tell you about Three Black Halflings, a conversational comedy podcast hosted by Jasper Cartwright, Olivia Kennedy, and Jeremy Cobb. Three nerdy friends with strong opinions and even stronger charisma scores. Having grown up in different corners of the world, they bring a diverse range of perspectives as they talk about their experiences as people of color in pop culture fandoms, D&D, and the TTRPG community. Born of a love of all things nerdy, all three of them share personal and often hilarious stories, challenge typical fantasy tropes, and tackle diversifying fantasy, all whilst discussing the things they love. From Lord of the Rings to the Marvel Cinematic Universe, playing your first tabletop role-playing game, or advice for seasoned adventurers, there's something for everyone. They've brought on an array of guests from all around the roleplay community and beyond, including Christina Ariel, Brendan Lee Mulligan, Jake Hurwitz, Lou Wilson, and many more. The list goes on and on. Join them in their quest to explore diversity in the incredible worlds of D&D and pop culture through thought-provoking conversations and good times. Subscribe to Three Black Halflings on Apple, Spotify, Pocket Casts, or wherever you get your podcasts. New episodes drop every Monday and Thursday. So long, Shire folk! Timpani drags Frog into the entrance of the door before casting Cure Wounds on her at second level for 20 points. Frog is brought back up to 20 points of health. Hey, is Farrah made out of jam or was I dreaming? And as you all look around the shabby first floor of this mining company building, you see the elderly dwarf standing before you and the clicking semi-mechanical bat lands on his shoulder. I see you all made it in safely to a certain degree. Yeah, for the most part. Mm. Are we gonna die? Is that thing gonna blow this whole building up? Are we safe? So far it hasn't come inside. It seems to be safe in here. Are you Amber Smith? One of them. What happened to and Amber Smith? The, uh, beast outside made it a little complicated. He's missing at the moment. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Hmm. It's fine. The elderly dwarf walks towards you with a sort of a limp, moving very slowly. He seems very jerky in his movements. Hira casts an appraising eye over his frame. Make an investigation check. 19. As you stare at this dwarven fellow, Turning from you for a moment to limp away, you see something strange at his foot, as if some sort of magical illusion is not keeping up with his movement. What are you hiding? The dwarf stops moving and looks at you over his shoulder. Well, you can't blame me for trying. And the illusion starts to drip off of him. And what you see standing before you is a much taller individual around six feet tall, but lean, wearing a very ornate set of studded leather armor. The skin is a pale purple tint and has double-pronged pointed ears, as well as black hair tied back into kind of a messy bun, wearing small round spectacles with a chain that hangs around the chin loosely. 
I thought it would be more acceptable if I looked like I worked here. If you're going to lie, you should be better at it. I didn't have much time. There was a giant monster outside. Wait, so the hat was fake? Unfortunately, yes. As he looks at Frog, his eyes go wide and he becomes intensely interested. Zella, make an investigation check. 28. His eyes alight with interest. Zella begins to walk towards Frog. You are interesting, aren't you? I've never seen one of you alive. Oh, so you've seen others like me, just not awake? Awake is a word you could use, yes. Farah, halfway reformed, slithers over and gets between Frog and the stranger. Oh. Okay, I'm gonna need you to back up. Oh, I'm so sorry. I believe you misunderstand my intentions. I'm just interested in that your friend here seems to be made or has come from Aeor. Farah scrutinizes, wondering if this man is telling the truth. Roll an insight check. Eleven. Zella, make a persuasion or a deception check. Natural 20. Zella moves the spectacles down to the tip of his nose. His eyes have a lightly glowing green pupil that is split into double almost like the pupil is splitting via mitosis in both eyes and says, Trust me, I bear you no ill will. I'm just... Mm. Professional curiosity, you could say. Oh, well, if you're a professional, we're looking for a merchant of some kind. Actually, um, they're supposed to be somewhere in this gorge. They were supposed to maybe know, like, more about me. Oh, you said Aeor, so you know where I'm from. Frog! Clearly, he's the merchant. Uh, I believe introductions are in order. My name is Zella, and this is Micah. Timpani, finally collecting himself, takes a good long look at Zella, trying to discern the origin of Zella's magic. Roll an arcana check. 11. Zella, uh, am I correct in assuming that your magic is, uh, fey in nature? Ah. You could say that. Zella smiles at you and you see that their teeth and the entire inside of their mouth are jet black. I, unfortunately, at an early age, had a bit of a run-in with a hag. And that is why my appearance is as such. I think there is a misconception here. He's not bad, he's just spooky, that's all. Hearing the word fey, Farah tries to make her own conclusions on his magic. Roll an arcana check with advantage. Nat 20. Farah, you immediately recognize that the magic that is infused within Zella was probably due to extended proximity to a hag, meaning that Zella spent years with one. Based on the advancement of Zella's hag-like development, you can probably assume that he spent his early childhood with this hag, as well as much of his adolescence. But he despite his aesthetic appearance, appears to be mostly human. Seems like a little more than a run-in with a hag. Mm, well, you could say my parents put me up for adoption. Okay, so you were raised by a hag. In so many words. Listen, people can't control who their parents are, okay? Some people have a mother and a father. Some people have a father and a father. Some people have a hag. We are here to do business. We look at your wares. We give you a fair price. I like your bat. We can all be friends. Hey, I'm all about doing business, but can we address that giant shark outside? Yeah, that's the biggest land shark I've ever seen, and I used to be part of a hunting party that used to track land sharks. Oh, let me check the monster tome. Frog unwraps the tome from her back, quickly going page by page by page, looking for notes on this magma land shark. Roll an investigation check with advantage. 16. There is indeed an entry, labeled under the Spectrum Gorge in the Demithor Valley, of the slaying of a massive magma land shark. Disproportionately large, likely due to the elemental quality of the underground steam springs beneath the Spectrum Gorge. There are scattered notes that mainly warn of flame and magma, and one very large, all-capital-lettered note 
that reads, Watch out for the breath. The slaying date is 55 years ago. Frog reads this entry out to the group. This must be because of the timber blades still. There's still monsters rising from the dead. I don't get it. Yeah, we haven't had a lot of time to talk since Osisa, but my whole riddle thing was all about how we didn't do a good enough job with the timber blade. Huh? Yeah, it was like kind of a dressing down. I got like big time scolded. You did? We didn't? Well, it was pretty vague and I'm not good at riddles, but it seemed to hint that maybe we hadn't fully finished the job or there was some sort of leftover timber blightiness. It's really hard. I mean, it was like a, kind of a limerick that she gave me and I didn't really understand and I asked her to repeat it and she wouldn't do it. Do you remember any of it? Timpani, roll a history check. 17. Yeah, she somehow rhymed bumbling furbolg with great mycelium. I don't remember how she got from A to Z. Something about how the timber blight spread across the earth so we didn't clean up all of the mess. But yeah, something like that. That was the gist. How long have you had to deal with this uh, reanimated land shark? I came here about two months ago with a companion of mine who works as a sort of mm, bodyguard for my travels as a merchant who tends to move around a lot. I am part of a society called the League of Aeorian Historians. Wow, that sounds really cool. It is. Part of our purposes here is to follow up on any leads that are reported for any sort of unusual artifacts found to see if they could be from Aeor. Now we came here, as I said, a couple of months ago, and my companion, Sasha, has been helping lead expeditions down into the mines, protecting the miners and also keeping an eye out for any unusual looking tech. It was about two weeks ago at this point, Sasha led a team of about 10 down into the mine shaft like normal, but then things went a little wrong. The rest of us up here started hearing screams coming from deep beneath the dig site. And one of the miners came back up from the elevator shaft, frantically yelling that Sasha had been eaten by a beast. Before anyone could mount a rescue, this great behemoth exploded out of the recesses beneath the site, burning and flattening everything in its path. All the workers have fled after the monster's rampage, but I stuck around. I have hope. See, Sasha and I have um, a sort of code of conduct in that I give her, I give her one of my teeth, which allows me to communicate with her rudimentarily. And if I concentrate, I can see what she sees once. So after a couple of days of hearing nothing from her and having this monster roaming around on the surface i took a chance and looked all i saw was fire and i heard screams and i felt heat so i'm assuming that terrible wail you heard when you entered into the valley is sasha inside the beast oh no I would very much like to have my companion back. So I've stuck around to try and find a way to make that happen. Is there a reason that that huge land shark doesn't just bash down the walls of this place and kill us all? I'm not entirely sure. I did give it a few jolts early on, so maybe it's because of that. What do you mean by jolts? He raises his hand up, and there's a gem in the center of the palm of his left hand, and it crackles with electricity. I've made a few modifications to my armor. Timpani steps away from the conversation and begins inspecting the foundation of the building. Roll a perception check. 17. As Timpani scoots around the interior walls of the mining building, he puts one furry ear to the floorboards and just barely picks up the sound of running water. 
Guys, I think there's some sort of underground river or something. Is there a way to get down and check? Ah, I believe so. Come through the back rooms over here, we can check. Zella begins to lead them through the bottom floor of the building towards a door set into the back. As the door opens, you see a stone-hewn pathway that curves, leading down deeper into the earth. The rushing water that Timpani mentioned is just barely audible. I believe this leads down underground to connect with the rest of the facility underneath. Okay, so I have a proposition for you. I don't know if you know this, we are very skilled ghost hunters. I didn't. We can maybe dispatch this ghost for you, bring you back your Sasha, and you can maybe have some bits or bobs that go into or on our friend, yes? I am... uh... No one said she was my Sasha. I, um, I, you, 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 you're proposing a trade, yes? Yes. Ah, uh, yes, I think that we can absolutely do something. I'm sure I have some items that could be of use to you. Can I see them? Just to, you know, see if they are compatible or... And also see that I indeed have anything that you would want. I wasn't going to say it <laughs> like that. But... Yes, and come, come with me. Zella leads them out of the room again, back towards the front door and up a staircase. And upstairs you see a somewhat temporary sort of general store that has been set up in this building. And he leads you through the store, behind the counter, to a door. Opens the door and there is a workshop back there full of tinkering tools and anvils and all sorts of things. It's definitely a workshop for someone who makes armor and experiments on technology. As the door opens, there is a metal scrabbling across wood as something is moving within the room. Everyone make a perception check. 10. Natural one. 23. 13. 12. Boogs rolls a five. Something suddenly flies off of the counter, shooting towards Frog at great speed. But Zella is able to raise a hand to catch it. Zella snatches the item out of midair and holds it up and it is a piece of armor plating that is contoured looking like the shape of a palm of a hand interesting it's never done anything like that before was it aiming for me as you hold it zella it seems to tug its way towards frog magnetized to her body i'd say yes frog holds out her hand Well, let's call this a down payment. Zella lets go of the item. It flies out of Zella's hand, slams into Frog's palm, and with a kerchunk, melds with her body. It fits perfectly. Oh, fits like a glove. Frog, make an arcana check. Seven. Nothing else happens. You know that there is something new attached to your hand, but do not know how it functions, nor its purpose. Huh, well, that's cool, I guess. Hira takes Frog's palm and looks at it carefully, investigating the wear patterns along the edges of the new plate. Make an investigation check. 15. Hira, as you inspect the armor piece, you see there are many scuff marks in the middle of the palm. Things are clearly meant to be gripped or set into the palm. And from there, the function is a mystery to you. I mean, you seem to have one of these on your palm. Can you? Ah, the one in my palm is slightly different, but what I believe that does is give you the ability to identify items of their true properties. Like some kind of way to detect something? Detect an item's true properties, what it would actually do. Similar to the way a spellcaster would, I assume. Oh. One moment, can I ask why that person is made of jam? No. You're not made of jam, or I'm not allowed to ask? You're not allowed to ask. Got it. Can I ask? Okay, here's the deal. And I feel like maybe I can make a similar deal with you. Dr. Fitzwaggle has allowed me to test some of his creations. I see you're an inventor as well. 
if there's anything that you've created that you would like to test in the field, I'm happy to do so, clearly. I'm sure Dr. Fitzwaggle is a absolutely qualified medical professional. I have other things that could be useful to you after we take care of this. We'll do this for you, and you can trade with us for any other missing pieces of frog or anything else that could help us on our way. I see that you have Micah. This is going to be very dangerous work. And she takes the egg from Poogs and says, I don't want this going where we're going. I will have Micah keep an eye on your egg while we're gone down there. As you look at Micah, who flies and sort of lands on top of the egg, you get a closer look at her and It appears as though Zella has laid out a fake skin and fur to cover parts of Micah, but it is definitely a mechanical construct that is animated. Wait, there's an egg now? Okay, wait, we, I thought we were a team, guys. I feel like everybody has stuff that we haven't talked about, myself included. I should have mentioned Osissa's limerick, but you got the jam thing going on and there's an egg now? Like, what's this egg? All right, well, look, I think Kira's right. Let's go find out what the source of that water is, and maybe we can plan an attack on this thing. Clearly, it doesn't like water if it doesn't want to come here. Well, if you're all ready to go, we can head down. Um, but you did just take quite a tumble, so if you need a moment to rest, I understand. If we're safe for now, I think that's probably a good idea. The Reeslayers take spread out on the second floor of this building and take a short rest. Farah. Roll a constitution saving throw. Eight. You remain jelly. Each of the Reeslayers takes spends hit dice to recover their hit points fully. Gathering themselves up after their short rest, they gather in front of the door that leads to the cavernous tunnel. This is a situation where it is best to move quietly. If you stay close to me, The worst effects of any tremors or earthquake should be negated, but the farther from me you get, the worse it will be. I've done a few modifications to my boots. The boots vibrate very subtly as Zella clicks his heels and activates them. Doubles as a foot massager. Farrah, do you want to get in my backpack? No, thank you. Okay. Here's the thing. If I get out of my form, it's going to take a whole thing to, like, reform. I feel like if I can just stay... In one piece, hopefully the jam will set. With her poncho back on, Frog says to Farah, At least you didn't leave a mark. Everybody make a stealth check with advantage, flanking Zella. 17. Dirty 20. 28. Dirty 20. 25. And Poogs rolls an 11. A group success. Quietly moving their way down into the cavern, the rushing water slowly gets louder and louder, turning around 180 degrees as it slopes further and further down underground. The tunnel suddenly widens out into a vast underground mine, pillars of stone keeping the mine intact and running through the basin, a deep flowing river of bubbling hot water. It is pungent down here, smelling of sulfur, and the water echoes along the walls, making it difficult to hear much else. Frog, I'm curious. Can you smell? Um, no. Interesting. You know, it's also fascinating. I don't have to breathe, I don't have to sleep, I can't eat, and we're not sure if I even have a heart. Not sure what makes me tick. Fascinating. Well, if you wouldn't mind, um, After this is over, if I could maybe make an examination. I'm just so curious. Remembering the way that Devexian talked about this merchant, Frog's eyes narrow. She crosses her arms over her chest. Um... Maybe. I don't want you to do anything you are uncomfortable with. Thank you. You're welcome. Creeping out of the shadows on all fours, Kira's voice reverberates with a darkness you haven't heard before as she says, Shit. Zella, 
Make a wisdom saving throw as Hira casts command. Three. Zella begins to sit against his will. As Zella's body follows the command and he begins to sit, the armor he's wearing activates and four insectile legs spring out of the back of it and plant themselves into the ground to stop him from sitting and hold him in position. I am not sure why you're doing this. The legs are fighting as Zella's body is trying to sit, but the legs are stopping him. A darkness seems to roil out from Hera's form for a moment as she stands intimidatingly over the now slightly shorter Zella. And in this tense moment, as everybody silently stares at the conflict that appears to be reaching ahead, everyone notices the water has begun to slowly recede, dropping in intensity to a trickle. Everybody make a perception check. 19. 15. Dirty 20. Nat 20. 21. 11 for Pooks. Zella, Frog, and Timpani all turn directly around to see that the hole that the water is blasting out of is no longer a hole, but rather is filled in with something dark, purple, and almost fungal in quality. The water is stopped up and blocked. If it was afraid of the water, then... There is a rumbling in the earth and a screaming cry from deep in the mine. Slayer's Take is a Meta Pigeon production in partnership with and distributed by Critical Role Productions, developed in association with Hero Club. Game mastered and produced by George Primavera and Nick Williams, featuring Nick Williams as Timpani Guff, George Primavera as Poogs, Jasmine Bular as Hira Agnihart, Jasmine Chong as Farah, and Caroline Lux as Frog, with special guest Alexander Ward as Zella Blacktongue. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time. Society called the League of Aeorian Historians. Wow. Which that rhymes cool. more than I thought it did when I wrote it down. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was intentional. <laughs>